Hello Year 4 and welcome to the next lesson in your Heroic Home Front History topic which is all about Fareham during World War II. Last week we found out all about the history of Harrison Primary School. You can see here the photograph of the secondary boys class in 1932 and the staff of the girls part of the secondary school in 1939. I started to think about how life in Fareham would have been very different in the 1930s. We're looking here at a map of Fareham from that time versus a map of Fareham today with Harrison Road right in the middle. This week, I really want you to think about what your home is like now and how does that compare with life in the past? Firstly, I want you to look around your home. What do you see? What's your kitchen like? Where do you cook your food and where do you keep it cold? Think about your living room. What items do you see there that are used by your family every day? Next, think about your bathroom. Where does your hot water come from? Do you have a bath and a shower? Next, we're going to take a tour of what a typical house would have been like in the 1930s. I want you to think about what are the key differences between then and now. Let's get started with our tour in the living room or the sitting room. It's decorated in a very popular style of the 30s and 40s, known as Art Deco, and the family would have kept the same furniture throughout the war that was yet to come, as these things would have been in very short supply. The focus of the room was the fireplace, and the coal fire was the main source of heat. The room would have been cosy and warm when the fire was lit. Children would use the sitting room as a play area rather than their bedrooms at that time. Pride of place in the room was the radio, or the wireless as it was known then. The news was the focus point of the family's listening day, but there was also comedy programmes and a children's hour with programmes especially for children to listen to. The family would also have had a record player known as a gramophone for listening to records of music on. You had to wind the gramophone up yourself to make it work and the records were easily scratched or broken. As you look around the house of the 1930s, just think, how does this compare with how we live today? What was the main focal point of the room in the house of the 1930s? What's the main focal point of your living room now? Next, let's go to the kitchen of the 1930s house. There are very few, if any, appliances that can save you any work and effort here. Hardly any British houses at this time had fridges and none would have had a freezer. There were not really any washing machines yet and the household laundry would have had to have been done in a tub of heated water. At the time, Monday was laundry day in Britain and it was very time consuming. All washing up and laundry would have had to have been done with soap or soap flakes as there was no detergents other than that. How is this different to how you do your laundry at home today or how you do your washing up? Perhaps you have a dishwasher in your kitchen and you don't do the washing up very often at all. Keeping the house clean would have been a very time-consuming task. Most houses just had a carpet sweeper like this, and the floor would then have to be swept and mopped with a bucket of soap and water to keep it clean. What modern appliances do you have in your home for cleaning today? As there was no fridge, most of the family's edible food would have been placed in the larder cupboard or pantry in older houses. Things like milk that might go off would need to be bought and used every day or two as they couldn't be stored. You might recognise some of the foods in the house of the 1930s though as we still have them today. How does the modern day kitchen compare? What are the main differences that you've spotted between your home and the kitchen of the 1930s? It's important to know also that at this time it was mainly women, housewives, who did a lot of the work and the cooking and the cleaning in the home. Is this still the way it is in your house today? Now let's look at the dining room of the 1930s house. In those days, the family would have eaten most of their meals in this separate room all together at the same time. Do most houses today still have a separate dining room and do we use them every day to sit down and share our meals in or do we eat differently? You can see here the teapot on the table in its tea cosy to help it keep warm throughout the meal. Some foods were even different at the time. 
Popular meals at the time were things like this, steak and kidney pie. Are meal times different today to those of the 1930s house? What are the main changes that you've noticed? A built-in bathroom was not all that common in the 1930s house as most homes still used a tin tub filled with hot water for washing. There were no showers. Also, most houses still had an outside toilet at this time and quite often this toilet would have been shared by a large number of families. So what we're looking at here in this footage is quite a rich household. Notice there are some products, some sort of shampoos and detergents and things for shaving. But poorer households would have still heated their water on the coal fire and used it in the tin tub. The whole family would have shared it to make sure that they were all clean. The master bedroom would have had goose eider down bedspreads and blankets. Also, a hot water bottle would be needed in the cooler months. As you see here, they were made of pottery to be filled with hot water to warm the bed. There would have been only a very small electric fire for heating the room. Men's clothes were not that varied at the time and the average man wouldn't have been too interested in fashion. Most men had two suits, one for normal wear and one for best. There weren't very many cosmetic products at the time, but ladies would wear face powder and night cream and perhaps some lavender water as perfume, as you can see on the dressing table here in the 1930s bedroom. Now on to the children's bedroom. This room that we're seeing here in the 1930s house would have been for two school age boys. You can see the sorts of toys they had to play with at the time, like the model tank on the mantelpiece. They would have had a bookshelf filled with popular children's books like Biggles and the Just William stories, which we still have today. Toys were not in huge supply. Notice when we look into the toy box what they're made of and how this compares with your toys today. Lastly, the front bedroom would usually be reserved for the teenager or young adult girl of the family. As we look around, think about the fashions of the time. How do these differ with the young ladies of today? What would you expect to see in a teenager's room that you don't see here? Now that we've had a look at how the homes of the 1930s compare with today, we're going to think more about life in Fairham at that time. Fairham has grown from being only a small market town and port to a much larger urban area over the last century, as more houses have been built and its old industrial past of brick making and pottery have come to an end. In the 1930s, Fairham was a typical Hampshire market town, busy on market days and relatively sleepy for the rest of the week. Our task for this week is to look at how an area that we all know well has changed from the 1930s to now, the town centre. Our activity for today is called Jump Into a Picture. I'm going to show you some photographs of Fairham that were taken in the 1930s, so they're primary sources. We're going to look at how the same place in Fairham has altered and how it looks today. What we'd like you to do is note down on your task sheet that has the same photographs for you to compare what the differences are, what do you spot. I've drawn some arrows to particular things of interest on the first one for you to show you how to label your photographs for the task. Here's one of the photographs that you'll find on the task sheet. It's of Union Street in Fairham today and this is it 90 years ago. What evidence of the past can you spot? What are the differences all of that time ago? Here's another, this is West Street in Fairham today versus 90 years ago. Lots and lots of changes that I'm sure you can pull out of that photograph that you can spot. Fairham really does look very different. This is another view of West Street. I'm sure you'll recognise this place. This is today. And there we are. In 1935, this photograph was taken. What do you spot? What are the differences between then and now? Another shot of West Street, this is on the pedestrianised part, well it's pedestrianised now, and this is how it looked in the 1930s. Finally, there's a couple of different views of the bus station here, which I'm sure you've all visited before. This is how it looks now, but this is how it looked in the 1930s. You might want to stop the video now so that you can complete that part of the task before we carry on with the next section of our history for today. To 
Towards the end of the 1930s, an event occurred that was to change Fareham and indeed Britain forever. On the 3rd of September 1939, the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, announced that Britain was at war with Germany. World War II had begun. Imagine how you would have felt if you'd been listening to his radio broadcast on that day. This is London. You will now hear a statement by the Prime Minister. I am speaking to you from the Cabinet Room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British Ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. You can imagine what a bitter blow it is to me that all my long struggle to win peace has failed. Yet I cannot believe that there is anything more or anything different that I could have done and that would have been more successful. Up to the very last, it would have been quite possible to have arranged a peaceful and honorable settlement between Germany and Poland. But Hitler would not have it. He had evidently made up his mind to attack Poland whatever happened. And although he now says he put forward reasonable proposals which were rejected by the Poles, that is not a true statement. The proposals were never shown to the Poles, nor to us. And though they were announced in the German broadcast on Thursday night, Hitler did not wait to hear comments on them, but ordered his troops to cross the Polish frontier the next morning. His action shows convincingly that there is no chance of expecting that this man will ever give up his practice of using force to gain his will. He can only be stopped by force. And we and France are today, in fulfillment of our obligations, going to the aid of Poland, who is so bravely resisting this wicked and unprovoked attack upon her people. We have a clear conscience. We have done all that any country could do to establish peace. But a situation in which no word given by Germany's ruler could be trusted and no people or country could feel itself safe had become intolerable. And now that we have resolved to finish it, I know that you will all play your part with calmness and courage final part of our task for this lesson is we'd really like to know what questions you have that you'd like to find out the answers to throughout this topic. You can write them on the task sheet, you can email them to the year four email and we'll make sure that we work them into all of our learning for this term. Good luck with your history learning this week year four.